Okay, welcome to the final session. Um, our next presenter is a senior developer at SignIQ, a leading supplier of shelf edge labels in the retail environment. He loves Python for its simplicity and RESTful APIs for their beauty. To teach us about BuildBots, please welcome Mark Lakebud. Hi everyone. Um, so just a few questions to start up with. Uh, so who doesn't use continuous integration at the moment? I'm sorry that you don't get to use it. It's really, really, really good. Um, and also, who has tried using and installing BuildBot? Uh, right, I'm sorry for you guys as well that you've had to go through that. Um, and also, uh, who came here because they like Transformers and they got the uh, reference in the title right? Yeah, I I'm sorry about that as well. That was a shameless uh, kind of reference for me. I have no idea about Transformers, but I've tried to put a few references throughout, so, so uh, see if you can spot them. All right, cool. Uh, who am I? I'm Mark Lakewood, developer um, at Underplank on Twitter. Um, if you've got questions or whatever, just give us a yell on Twitter. Um, I currently work at SinaQ in Perth. Uh, as was said, uh, we're an industry leader in self shelf edge marketing. It basically means the little tickets when you go into Woolworths on that tell you the price. We make the software that prints those, which is a little bit crazy. Um, this talk and also a full kind of template version of a BuildBot config um, is all on GitHub at that URL. Um, and potentially if you've got a laptop and you want to have a look at it while it's going on, it might make it a little bit easier to follow the, the code snippets and stuff. Um, and as it, you know, it's on GitHub, it's there for you guys to use. So if you need a kind of getting started template of how a BuildBot config probably should look like, um, then go and have a look at that. Cool. So Shia needs a continuous integration server. She is a developer. He's worked out that he's, you know, needs a continuous integration server. Um, why BuildBot? Um, one of the advantages of BuildBot is unlike something like Jenkins, um, which is like a jar file that you run and then you configure and it's a server, um, BuildBot's kind of more like a library. Um, so you, 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 know, you import all of the BuildBot functions and classes and put it together, build it possibly, um, and you get a continuous integration server. It's also just a twisted server, so if you're used to twisted, um, that makes it really easy to kind of know your way around it. Um, and it's really, really configurable because it's all just Python files, like it's just Python functions and stuff. Why wouldn't you choose BuildBot? Well, with configurability comes no structure. Um, generally speaking. So because it is just a bunch of functions that you put together and wire it all together, um, there's not any kind of structure like Jenkins hats or something like that. Um, that's kind of a good thing and it's also a really, really bad thing. And the problem is that everybody kind of configures their BuildBot a different way um, and generally the public versions of BuildBot configurations like the Django public one. It's very specific for Django and uh, is awfully complicated if you're basically running your own product tests on it because Django needs to run on everything. Um, so yeah. Um, also the documentation is really, really good um, for like at an API level. It's not very good at uh, kind of foundational concepts. And there's a couple of foundational concepts in BuildBot that you need to know, otherwise all the API documentation in the world doesn't help you at all because you have no idea how to actually put it together, which if anybody that's tried it and failed was like me, that was the thing that I was missing. Cool. So yes, you can't just simply build a robot. So this is kind of what BuildBot looks like. Um, this is from 0.7.5, um, and I couldn't actually find it in a later version. BuildBot is now up to 0.8.7, I think. Um, 
but it's pretty much exactly the same. You have this concept of a build master that get cha gets changes from a version control system. Um, it can push out status of builds to browser email, IRC, whatever, and it has a bunch of build slaves that it tells to do things. Um, so these is uh, installation tips from Shear that he hit along the way. Um, obviously, use a virtual env if you're not use one. Um, it has the latest version of BuildBot, as I said, I think it's 0.8.7, has a little bit of a quirk, which is that uh, it requires SQL Alchemy, um, and SQL Alchemy migrate, but it installs by default through a pip install uh, SQL Alchemy 8, and SQL Alchemy migrate doesn't work with SQL Alchemy uh, 8. So you basically just need to kind of go back a version. Um, and yeah, I'm not sure what they're doing about that, but it's, it's a fairly minor thing. Cool. So um, this, is the, this is kind of the file structure I, I set up. Um, I like having things in separate files. I like having separate concepts in separate files. Um, and it makes it a lot clearer. Some of these are literally like two or three lines long, um, but it means they're all in separate modules and you know all of that kind of stuff. Um, this whole structure is on that on that GitHub repo, um, and it's fully filled out, so you can use it and extend it and build on it and do whatever the hell you want with it. Um, and these, uh, so the builders, build steps, change source, schedulers, slaves, and status, all kind of map to those foundational concepts that I were talking, was talking about. Um, and so as we go through, basically, I'm just going to explain what each of those ones are and then put it all together at the end. And you should have enough to kind of understand what you need to do to get a build bot working. Cool. Uh, so you can see transformer down the down the bottom. It's a robot, right? So it's transformer. Um, <laughs> so uh, build steps. These are probably what you think of when you think of um, a continuous integration server. These are the things that it does. So that's tests, pylint. Uh, you do have automated tests, right? Uh, pylint, static analysis, uh, coverage. Um, JS Lint, which if you've got any JavaScript, please, dear God, run JS Lint on it whenever you can. Um, and pretty much, you're just looking at, like, um, BuildBot has this thing called a shell command, which is literally just executing some kind of shell command. It has some other fancy things in there. So, uh, for example, PyLint has its own class that you can run, which does nice highlighting and stuff like that of the error output. But essentially, what you need to do is you need to get a list of the commands you want to run every single time um, a commit happens and put those into these shell commands. And it's that kind of Python exec v thing where you get a command and split it into a list and pass it in. Um, so typical steps. Um, you need a source step, which is a particular type of build step, um, which is you know, a class that you instantiate uh, to check out your code, because you kind of need your code to run these kind of things. Um, clean up your resources. So, you know, for every build, you're going to build resources. You want to build it into a virtual env. You want to install all of your packages and, you know, do other things, potentially. Um, and you need to then clean it up ready for the next build, or just clean it up at the start and build it at the start, whichever order you feel like doing. Uh, run your automated tests, run your PyLint, run your JavaScript tests, and then run your JSLint. So that, that's a typical thing, but you can do anything you want with it. Um, so builders, um, these are the kind of different type, uh, different builds that a, that a build bot master can run. So these could poten potentially be completely different software stacks. You can have a build bot master build all kinds of different software. If you've got six or seven different products, you could have one build bot master running all of the different ones, and they could be different um, builders. They could also potentially be just different um, different branches of your repository. So you have a sprint branch, you have a development branch, you have a 
master branch in Git or whatever, and each one of these maps to one of those. So when a commit comes in on one of those, this builder gets run. Um, that's this uh, code there is basically the um, the thing to make a builder. So you give it a name, you tell it which slave you want to run it on, um, you tell it on which directory in the slave you want to run it on, um, and you get the build steps uh, from the previous uh, slide or the previous file. So get build steps is actually just a function that returns all of the build steps and they get past the builder and the builder goes, oh, okay, I'm going to go off and build that on that slave. Um, uh, change sources, so uh, it's kind of self-explanatory, but it's, it's which, uh, the defines which repository will trigger the build. So in this case, um, any change that happens to build bot rollout will, uh, which is the GitHub repo, um, will cause a change um, event, basically, which then filters through to the builders and, and all the way through. Um, and it supports all the VCSs, all of them. Um, this is Git, but does SVN and everything else. Cool. Um, so a scheduler. So you've got your you've got your change that's come in. Um, you've allocated it to a uh, builder, and you've got a set of build steps that the builder needs to to run. What this scheduler basically does is go it joins the change that comes in to the builders, and therefore the build steps. So uh, in this case. Um, we're just building a single branch, and it's the master, you know, the um, the tree stable timer. So the tree stable timer is there. So if you do a single change and it triggers a build, and then you go, oh, I really need to change that, and you change one more and one more and one more, then you've got three commits coming in with three potential builds um, banked up. The tree stable timer, and that happens reasonably often, actually. Um, the tree stable timer basically just goes, well, I'm just going to wait for 60 seconds until you have finished and everything settled down and then I'll do a build. Um, and you can actually have this schedule more than one build, uh, a builder, so you could go off and build a whole bunch of different stuff. Um, okay, so slaves do all the work, don't they always? Um, so this is just a separate twisted daemon running. So this can be on the same machine uh, in our build bot um, at work, at where I work at SunAQ, we have it all on the same machine because uh, we don't need to put it anywhere else, basically. Um, and it's just a separate little twisted daemon that kind of registers. Uh, in this case, um, it the it passes a password called pass, um, and it says I'm slave. Now, you could have slave one, slave two, slave three, and slave four, and that's how you connect the builders with the slaves based on the name, um, slave name and password for authentication. Um, and this is configured on the slave in the buildbot.tac file. So if you haven't used Twisted before, TAC files are kind of like the way they configure things. Um, and that's all kind of created when you create the slave. Uh, status, this is what you really want to know because um, otherwise you don't know what the hell your build bot's doing. Um, the uh, top line is um, a web page and the bottom, line, the bottom section is um, a mail notifier. So whenever anything happens, basically it just sends an email out, notification to all of those things. Um, and uh, it can be notified by email, JSON API, or web-based um, thing, uh, website. Um, and you know it's really important to kind of bubble this information up as much as you can to all the development teams because everybody needs to know um, what's going on because otherwise you could just check something in and everything could fail and then you're like, well, you know, there's not much point then. Um, this is the default front end um, for BuildBot. Um, so when you do the previous web notificator, no notification, this is what you get. Um, there's also a JSON API, you can have a look up in the right hand corner, and that's really, really good for 
triggering things and gathering data and all kinds of stuff. Um, so in this case, I check something in um, on the rollout build uh, and all of those tests passed and we're all good. Um, and there's lots of different ways you can view that data and, and do all kinds of stuff. So this is where it really comes all together. Um, so you have a master.cfg file in your buildbot server directory that you create using buildbot create. Um, and it's just a dictionary. That's all it requires. Um, a dictionary with these um, keys in it and you pass all of the data back from the other, or all of the objects and lists of objects and stuff back from all of the other files. Um, so the slaves is just all of the slaves. Schedulers are the schedulers we defined. The builders are all the builders we defined. Uh, the status is all the status. What where um, the slave port number is where the slaves connect to. Uh, change sources, change source, title, build bot URL. And uh, the DB URL, you can uh, put that in a Postgres database if you like. It's not a hell of a lot of data. Um, if you really want to kind of do a lot of analysis about test failures and all of that kind of stuff, it might be helpful. Otherwise, it just uh, all the build information just sits in a little SQ SQLite database. Cool. Uh, so, to create the two directories that have all of these files in it, um, the, the uh, master, you just do build bot create and give it a directory name and it'll lay down all the files it needs. Um, and then you, and uh, the and where you want to put the build slave, you just, again, put that in another directory. Um, and then if you pull down, all uh, oh right, copy all our configuration files into the master directory. So that big list of um, files that um, is on my is on the GitHub repo and that I mentioned at the start, you just copy all of that into uh, rollout master. And um, so the master.cfg file needs to be in the root of that folder. Um, there's a few configuration things that you need to do uh, to make the build bot tack point at that. Uh, but once you've done that, uh, you start it up and then start the build slave up. And troubleshoot, because there probably will be some troubleshooting along the way. Hello. There we go. Cool. So the, the idea behind this talk wasn't necessarily to tell you exactly what you needed to do to set up a build bot or give you all the code. In fact, all the code is on the GitHub repo. But the idea was to kind of place out those kind of foundational concepts that you kind of need to get in your head and then that becomes really easy to set everything else up. Um, so it's got lots of advanced features as well. Um, you can do an IRC bot. Uh, it's got latent build slaves, so what that means is you can actually get build bot to spin up build slaves on EC2, um, and which if you've got a really big testing environment or um, you know you need to do parallel builds and stuff like that, um, it's really helpful. Um, you can request the status of build through the JSON API. So for example, uh, in your configuration management or deployment process, you could actually request and find out if the last build passed. And if it didn't, don't deploy. Um, if it did, go ahead. Um, and the best thing about the whole thing is it's all in Python. It is really just a bunch of Python files. So you can do anything you want to do in it in Python. Um, and it's completely configurable. Um, cool. Uh, any questions? It, it seems like it's uh, very Python oriented, which is great. I have other things that I need to build, like C and Ada and Java. Mm -hmm. Works well for that too. Yeah, um, as I say, the, the the to do all of that, your um, it's in the the build steps um, that that concept there, and the build steps are really just shell commands. So if you can build whatever you're, if you can do whatever you want to do on a command line, uh, you can trigger it through this. Um, I don't know if you've uh, kind of used subprocess or um, any of the kind of standard Python, uh, standard library Python functions that kind of run commands on a command line. It's 
pretty much exactly the same way you do that. Um, you can pass kind of environment variables in for that command and do all of that kind of stuff. So, you know, as kind of preparation for this, probably what you want to do is go get the commands you would run for your full kind of build, whatever that is, um, and write them down and then you can just convert them straight into um, into uh, the, the commands in there. Um, and as I said, it's kind of, it probably makes a lot more sense uh, looking at the source code that's in GitHub, um, but I couldn't fit the, <laughs> I couldn't fit all the code in these slides, uh, so I tried to kind of give examples of, of what it was. Um, but all of the code is in GitHub, and it's fully working, you know, kind of test environment. Uh, so have a look at those, and it'll probably make a lot more sense about you know what you can do in it um, once you've seen those. One more. Oh, yeah, sure. Um, are the build slaves, can I add them dynamically, or that's a, a static thing? You think you shut down the master and start it up again if you're adding new slaves? Um, I think by default, the way that, certainly the way that I've configured it, it's static. Um, although, saying that, it is all just kind of Python, so there might be a way to do it. Um, as I said, the, the the API documentation is pretty extensive. Um, it's just very specific, so you need to kind of know what you're looking for. Um, so, but saying that, starting and stopping the buildbot slave, buildbot master, and build buildbot slave is two commands. Um, so it's pretty well self-contained. So that was a, I don't know. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> All oh, right, there you go. You can just reread re the config file, and and it'll 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 bring new ones in. I, I really like the um, the Travis CI um, configuration file. It, it makes everything um, you know. Mm -hmm. it, it's very very simple to understand. Has anyone built uh, something that would allow you to um, use the Travis uh, .yml file with Buildbot? Uh, not that I know of. Um, it probably wouldn't be that uh, that difficult. I, I don't actually. I've I haven't used Travis CI, uh, so I'm I'm not sure what the the configuration file looks like. I, I believe it's a, a YAML file. Is that right? Uh, yeah. I think one of the differences with Travis CI is that it it, it um, uses virtual environments, so you always as uh, virtual machines. So it always starts with a kind of a blank virtual machine. So yeah. Um, I don't know if that would fit with how Billbot does things or not. Uh, well, Billbot does have the concept of latent slaves, uh, so you can basically do the do the same thing. Um, you can, you know, put in your EC2 uh, credentials, and it'll spin up latent slaves when it needs to. Um, that are just virtual machines, uh, and and oh, and I think it also has uh, hooks into like libvirt and and things like that, um, which gives you some pretty good flexibility. Uh, so I'm not sure about the configuration file, um, but then again, in my experience, the, the amount of commands you need to do is probably not that great, though if you are kind of apt getting a lot of stuff, then you would probably need to do that in there. Though saying that, you sh that should probably be in your deployment script, which could be part of your build bot setup. So, you know. Um, is the testing all based on return values from the commands that are run, or is it based on the output, or how does it? Um, the the shell command is is like return zero, you're all good. Non return zero, something broke. Um, but there are, as I said, there's like a specialised. Um, there's a, there's quite a few specialised shell commands, uh, not shell commands, build steps that you can run. So, for example, pylint will. Um, there's a special pylint build step that'll kind of parse the errors a little bit better for for pylint. Um, and uh, I would assume there's quite a few other ones, though I haven't looked that into that myself because. You know, we have six things that we need to do, and if they don't return zero, then it's broken. Um, so, and also the other advantage of having something like that is that then those kind of build commands directly map to something you're going to do in the terminal anyway. And if that's a non-zero, then something's failed. So, just to follow up, does it save the output from the builds and the tests? Yes. Yeah, yeah it does. So, 
uh, our, that's what that uh, the SQLite file is. Um, so it puts it in there by default. But as I said, it, that can be any any database, and it does SQL migrate, uh, SQL alchemy migrate, and all of that kind of stuff. Um, so, yep. I've got a, uh, a BuildBot installation. I'm not sure what version it is, mm -hmm. um, but I cheated and pulled the configuration files across from a, a previous machine and eventually got it half going. Well, it goes, actually it goes double. It doesn't matter where I commit, which branch I commit to, mm -hmm. it always kicks off a build. Um, would your, would your um, configuration files on GitHub um, would it be safe enough to just replace those and start again? Uh, potentially. Uh, I, I don't know. I don't know what your build block configuration. To, uh, are you using Git or SVN? Uh, SVN. SVN. Right. Uh, we've just moved from so that that configuration uh, that I've got on GitHub is for um, is for Git, uh, but we were just on SVN, and I did have a function that was a bit of a hack that worked out which branch had been built and match it to the right thing. Um, so if you want, I can I can send you that code. Um, that's that portion, um, and you can have a look at it and see where it needs to go. Um, so yeah, come and talk to me afterwards, and I'll to. and I'll yeah I'll help you out with that. No Thank problems. you. And I'm following up on the Travis question. Mm -hmm. uh, regardless of the format, Travis config is in my repository. Can I store all the build what config in the repository I want to build? Thank you. Uh, yeah. So, well, it depends what you're wanting to do with that configuration. Um, so, BuildBot is a server, so it's it's a, it's a separate deployment. We do have our BuildBot configuration in our source code repository because that's the best place to do it. That's not going to necessarily, well, I doubt it would be able to, uh, well, you could do a reload and a, and a remap and a, a, you could do some, you, you might be able to do some stuff that at checkout time it might configure your build bot configuration from the one that you just checked out. Uh, I think that's probably more work than is useful. Um, I would see BuildBot as a kind of a deployment, um, and when you need to update that deployment, you update that deployment. Um, thank you. Hi. Um, we run Jenkins, and one thing that impressed me with Jenkins was it was so easy to get going. Yep. So I guess there's two questions. One is, when, if ever, would you want to start with BuildBot? Mm -hmm. And when would you want to uh, replace something like Jenkins with BuildBot? Mm -hmm. Cool. Uh, it's a good question. Uh, you know, I, I think... Sometimes choices in which piece of software you use come down to a preference or some guy just making a decision, um, or some person, sorry, just making a decision at some point. Uh, we chose BuildBot because it's very lightweight. Uh, we know exactly what's going on. Uh, it's very explicit about what it's doing. Um, well, it's not that it's very explicit about, but you can be very explicit about what it's doing. Um, I've used Jenkins once or twice before, but not as much as I've used BuildBot. I think in most cases, if you, if you knew what you were doing with BuildBot and you knew you, what, what you were doing with Jenkins, it would be a 50-50. Um, if you needed something that was uber configurable, like you have something potentially like Django that is running on a whole bunch of different stuff and you have to do some weird configurations and stuff like that, um, and you are a Python developer, then BuildBot would give you a lot of configurability that you wouldn't be able to get from, uh, that I don't know that you can get from Jenkins. Um, that's not to say you can't get it from Jenkins, I just haven't used it enough, um, so. Were there any more questions? We've got probably time for one more. Uh, so if you've got a successful build, uh, can you then trigger to like push to a deployment or a staging server 
And is that a good idea? Uh, yeah, well, it's Python all the way down. So if you can push from Python, like if you've got a fab file or something like that, or, or even you've just got a command, uh, you, can, you can totally do that. Um, is it a good idea? Well, I mean, continuous integration and continuous deployment are, are two different things. Um, I've done continuous, inter well, I do practice continuous integration. I don't yet practice continuous deployment. Um, so I, I, don't have, I don't have the answer on that. There are a lot of successful companies um, that have a lot of developers that do do continuous uh, deployment, uh, Netflix, uh, Etsy, you know, all of these big uh, companies. Um, I don't have the experience to to say yes or no. For us, we prefer to have the control over what we deploy when because, you know, potentially we could commit something and all the builds pass and a feature isn't actually finished. So, yeah. Right, to say thank you, uh, we have some PyCon Australia coffee and the mug. And if you just join me in thanking Mark again for his talk. Cool, thanks guys.